thank you all for coming. I know some of you are here because I told you you get extra credit, um, but hopefully that extra credit is the enlightenment you're going to have as well. Um, I'm really happy that we have been able to get my friend and colleague, Dr. Um, Reverend Dr. Tamara Henry. Um, as you can read in the program, she is a minister to young adults working with young people from many parts of this great borough of Brooklyn. Um, her home base is at Lenox Road Baptist Church. Dr. Henry is an assistant professor of religious education at New York Theological Seminary and she holds degrees from both Georgetown University and Fordham University. Her scholarly research has a focus on the hip hop movement as a teaching learning form that can imaginatively re-envision religious education as a form of resistance that contests social and cultural oppression in the lives of young people. I'm not going to spend much more time introducing her because I don't want to take away from her time with you. Um, but full disclosure also, we are colleagues and friends, but I say without any bias, this is a woman who is an incredible scholar and a passionate preacher. So trust me when I say you're in for a treat. Uh, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Henry. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, let me first start off by saying um, that I am so grateful to um, Alexandria, Dr. Eckler, for the gracious invitation to come and be with you today. We've been in conversation about this moment for over a year. Tried to get it to happen earlier, but due to scheduling challenges, uh, we had to push it back. But I think this is the right time, uh, particularly because November is also, if you might not be aware, is Hip Hop History Month. So I'm excited about a conversation about hip hop and spirituality as it relates to the quest for faith, meaning, and purpose in the lives of young adults. I also have to thank um, Tim Nodge for his excellent, y'all can clap these people a little bit. <laughs> this kind of stuff just doesn't happen for the excellent support and all of the preparation um, that has gone into making today possible. So thank you so much for your efforts. And I want to thank you for coming. coming uh, because you didn't have to be here. I also want to give a special shout out uh, to some young adults and emerging adults who are also uh, students at St. Francis but a part of my faith community. So shout out to Latia and shout out to Rochella. So as I said, uh, today we're going to be talking about hip hop spirituality, exploring the young adult quest for faith, meaning, and purpose. And my hope is that this is not just going to be a monologue. I'm trying to warm you up, but that uh, it will be a dialogue of sorts. Uh, we do have a period. I'm probably going to uh, talk for about 30 minutes, and perhaps there will be some exchange even during that time. But at the end of this, we'll also have a period for Q&A. And if you don't get to ask your question during that time, you will certainly, I'll stick around for those of you who can hang around so that we can engage a little bit. Before we get to hip hop and sort of the, the, the young adult quest for faith, meaning, and purpose, I wanna talk a little bit about the work that I'm involved in. Uh, Dr. Egler highlighted that I am a professor at New York Theological Seminary and I am a professor of religious education. And from that site and in that role, I'm certainly concerned as a teacher and a researcher and scholar of uh, thinking about this intersection between religious, spiritual life and how we teach particularly through the lens and significance of, of all things, popular culture, and specifically popular cultures that are shaped and informed by the lives of young people and young adults who represent uh, marginalized constituencies. And one of those cultures, significant cultures for me, is hip hop culture. The other aspect of my life that assumes uh, tremendous significance and brings me great joy is my work as a minister to youth in the best Brooklyn 
in the best borough there is, Brooklyn, right? Anybody from Brooklyn here? I know you go to school in Brooklyn. Come on, Brooklyn Knights, you got to rep better than that. <laughs> um, I have been, uh, for the last two decades, working with young people and young adults in that context. And from our dual uh, site as both a professor and somebody who's engaged in the work, not just in theory, but in practice on the ground in a faith community, I spend a lot of time hanging out with young people, thinking about young people and young adults, researching and talking about it. And one of the things I know about young adulthood, right, from my own journey in young adulthood and from my conversations and from the work of so many theorists, is that young adulthood is a time of transition, right? Would you agree? That you are between between and betwixt all these different realities. You're between the dependence that perhaps you have on your parents and wanting to be independent, whether, whether that means moving out on your own or becoming financially independent. But the time of transition, right, that developmental phase that people identify as young adulthood is also a time that we know that you are engaging in big questions as it relates to your life, right, and the journey of your life. And certainly one of the areas, right, that you're thinking about is career and calling, right? You are thinking about sort of what vocation you might pursue in life. You have uh, elected a major, a course of study, and the hope is that somehow that's going to prepare you, right, for work in the real world post your graduation at St. Francis. And that's an important area to think about. The other area that you're thinking about, right, is this whole matrix of relationships. Is anybody thinking about relationships? Yes. Okay, y'all are gonna have to do better. <laughs> I, I, need, I need audio and visual, okay? <laughs> is anybody thinking about relationships? I hear Nick yes. in the front. Yes. So this is a period where you are thinking about, perhaps engaging in relationships, right? Thinking about, am I going to be married? And if so, perhaps who will I marry? So that's a significant part of life, right, at this stage. But the other question, right, that you're thinking about, and if you're not thinking about it, you certainly should be thinking about it at some point certainly as it relates to the other two areas, is what is the meaning or purpose of life, right? And that's sort of a broad, deep question. <laughs> Oftentimes with young adults, you sort of think about career and calling first, right? Or you're thinking about relationships, and that area kind of gets left behind in terms of the broad question of what is the purpose and meaning in life. But this area, Right? If you think about it, it can feed into and allow you to make decisions in the other two areas that will be fulfilling for your life. So when people think about what is the ultimate purpose and meaning in life, one of the ways that we sort of restate that is we're thinking about how do we really make sense, right, out of this life that we are living or we've been called to live. And one of the ways uh, that many people make sense out of life, right, among them many young adults, is to engage this idea of faith. And when we think about faith, there are many different ways to think about faith. One of the popular understandings around faith is to think about faith in relation to belief, right? And belief uh, for many people as it relates to religious belief and the identity or association with a particular religious way of life. But for very, you, a, a number of people, they don't think about faith in that way. Their understanding and engagement with faith is from a more universal, right, lens, through a more universal lens. They think about faith in the way of just a way in which they're trying to make meaning or sense out of the significant experiences of their lives that aren't necessarily uh, tied to a religious way of life. Whether or not you find yourself in the first category or the second category or neither of those categories, one of the things that we also associate with faith, 
right, is this idea of spirituality. And similar to faith, there's not just one understanding of spirituality. There are many different expressions of spirituality at work in the world. I'm going to talk about spirituality in the broadest sense. Spirituality in recognizing that when you think about life and you think about what you're engaging in in life, you think about it as related to something bigger than yourself, right? So beyond yourself, there's something bigger. Some people think about it in the way of, right, a relationship or engaging with God, or you're thinking about it as spirit, right, or the work of the spirit or spirituality in that sense. <coughs> So I'm, I'm, I'm defining it in the broadest sense. As a researcher and scholar and certainly practitioner, I am concerned with spirituality, how it finds expression in the lives of young people and young adults. And numerous studies right, have directed lots of attention to what spirituality among young adults looks like in a United States context. And here we're just going to do a Snapchat. I mean, not a Snapchat. A snapshot. You see? You are so embedded. Even in my grammar. Snapchat. That's a problem. All right. Come on in. So one feature, right, that these researchers, and not just researchers, but practitioners are observing, is that there is waning, right, decreased participation in religious institutions. I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I am going to put you on the spot. <laughs> By a show of hands, how many of you are a part of a faith community? Wow. I'm impressed. That's the majority in the room. That is not based on what these studies are saying, right, the norm that we're seeing across the board, especially as it relates to young adults. The other thing right that how many of you identify with this statement i'm spiritual and not religious all right okay so so fewer hands right so this is the other sort of feature that's emerging and it's connected to the first as people right are becoming and young adults are becoming less and less involved in faith communities and, and in institutional religious forms of life, uh, their language is also shifting. And this is not just specific to young adults, right? We saw this in other generations as well, as people are identifying themselves as spiritual and not religious. Uh, just a quick Q&A. What's the difference between the two, right? And let me get it, don't be scared. Let me get it, let me get it from somebody who raised their hand. What's the difference in your mind about being, uh, being spiritual versus being religious? Anybody? Take a stab at it. Now St. Francis, represent, right? Represent. What's the difference in your mind? Go ahead, what's your name? Dania. Dania. So, hi guys, I'm an alumni here and also an employee here. Awesome. My, the difference for me is the institutionalized version of going to church and just the, the, the image that goes with how I was brought up. Right. To me, feels boxed in mm. versus exploring your spirituality beyond that, knowing that you don't have to attend every Sunday and be this person and consider yourself spiritual. I don't know. So, so, <laughs> Dania Klecker for me. <laughs> I think that's a part of it, right? She's hitting a part of it, and if you have a different perspective, I'm gonna invite you to reflect on that. But it is connected to this first piece, right? And it's gonna set it up for why hip hop is assuming such significance in the faith, spiritual, and religious lives of young adults. It's this sense that there's more than one way to engage religion, spirituality, faith, right? That one expression of that is our connection, right, to faith community, but it isn't the only expression, right? Another dimension of that, of the distinction between spiritual versus religious, is that for some people, right, there's a sense that being religious is being tied not just to a community, but represents a more public dimension of one's faith. Spirituality, as some define it, seems to be more private. 
right? And it is tied to an autonomy, right? Around defining the terms of how one's faith and spirituality finds expression, okay? So I want to acknowledge that. Oh, but here's what I'm interested in. So for the last 20 years in East Flatbush, I have been a pastoral minister for young people and young adults. That's a lot of life, right? <laughs> Spending so many times developing programs, innovative programs, and work with those young people. And yet, over the years, I have seen um, not just young people within the context of faith communities, but perhaps those who would never step into the door of a faith community also be interested, right, in these big questions that have to do with purpose, faith, and meaning, right? And my engagement with them, and usually the engagement, I'll tell you how I got to hip hop, is around music, movies, media, and popular culture that creates an intersection with reflection on spiritual and religious thoughts in ways that a lot of people and institutions are overlooking or minimizing, right? So I'm really interested in this third category. Some people, when they read the research as it relates to, oh my God, young people are leaving faith communities and they're choosing to be spiritual versus religious or not to identify themselves as being associated with any of those categories. Some people read that, and I, I use this, I put this mark in quotations, uh, to suggest that young adults, right, millennials, or Gen Zers, the group that comes after millennials, that they are just becoming increasingly secularized, right? That you are not interested, you're not engaged in matters of faith and spirituality. And I want to suggest that for researchers who are engaged on work in the ground, who read research in alternate ways, that it's not so much that young people or young adults aren't participating, right? in religious or spiritual expression. They're just doing it in different ways, right? And here I describe it as they're participating in more marginal forms of spiritual and religious life. That's where hip hop comes in, all right? So I've titled this category, Hip Hop and Spirituality, Recreating Sacred Space. And I say that because hip hop and spirituality are not two things that people, right, usually associate as going together. Anybody, give me a sense. This is Hip Hop History Month. What is it about hip hop's connection with spirituality that might seem problematic for some people? Anybody? Yes, wait, come on. Come on. All right, I'm gonna come back to you. Somebody else, Nick, give it to me. Uh, for hip hop spirituality, I say that when I listen to a lot of that stuff, it gives me a sense of realism and knowledge of how impactful the lyrics are and like the tone and the sense and how serious it can be. How serious it can be. So it engages you in a particular way around matters that are real, real life difficulties. But I'm asking, what's problematic for some people, not for all people, about this union between hip hop and spirituality. Yes, give me your name. Shaikol. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it's like the, the combination of like secularism with, with I guess, uh, religious like motifs. And all. Right, so hip hop has been perceived as a primarily secular, right? Culture or way of life. So the notion that something secular could somehow be considered spiritual or sacred for some is confusing or problematic. Why else? Why else is this union? What's your name? Wait, I didn't hear the name. Eduardo. Eduardo. Yeah, and okay, I think awesome. that's because the message in hip hop is not really connected to anything religious or spiritual. The message, wait, are you saying that is the case? I, I mean, yeah, I think so. Okay, so Eduardo is saying that the message 
in hip hop is not religious or spiritual. How many people agree with that? Okay. How many people disagree with that? How many people just don't know? All right. You're, you're on it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> it's hip hop history buff, so let's just do a quick thing that links into why hip hop and spirituality might be strange bedfellows. Anybody, let me see how many of you know your history. Where was hip hop birthed? All right, all right. Nick, I'm gonna give somebody, give me your name. Kiana. Kiana, where was hip hop birthed? The Bronx. The Bronx, right, when? Circa, circa what? What year? Come on, take a stab at it. Wait, they're like seven, seven. So, which one, what is it? Come with it. It's late 70s, right? Late, late 70s. And what is significant about that time? That time period, late 70s, in the Bronx, and young people and young adults who are living in that section of the Bronx, what's significant? Yes, give me the name. Sasha. Sasha, come with it. Poverty, okay. So let me, go ahead. Also, it's like, it's post-civil rights era and then black era. Right. Mm. All right, you're layering it now. All right, so let's put all those here. Give me, give me this. Yes. From a history class today, and what I learned about this book I'm reading is Fear City, which we're doing in history class. It's mainly the tag Fear City in New York City, which a lot of the social problems are in, impacting what hip hop's about, like the oh message. Oh my God. Nick? Nick, can you just, Nick, you're on. Let me give you a high five for that. <laughs> all right, so let's see if we can link all these historical narratives. So hip hop emerges out of the South Bronx in the late 70s, and it emerges specifically out of the aesthetic imaginations, the artistic imaginations from young people, many of them African American, Caribbean, Latino, living in urban context, the South Bronx, and they use hip hop, and we're gonna talk about what hip hop is, as a way initially of igniting resistance to the social and moral ills that are plaguing their community. Uh, Nick is alluding to some of that, right? But what are those social and moral ills that were plaguing those communities at that time, those, that those young people were encountering? Anybody, give me one example, yeah. Drugs, okay, not just drugs in general, but what else? What else? Poverty, okay, what else? Uh, violence. violence, police brutality, right? Housing discrimination, right? Dwindling resources, inadequate recreational outlets for young people living in those communities. And out of that situation, similar to their civil rights predecessors, they turn to the arts as a way of engaging resistance and engaging in social protest against those conditions. Out of that, this amazing cultural movement is birthed out of neighborhoods where brown and black constituents, right, are engaging in urban context and they come up with four new artistic or aesthetic practices. What are they? What are the four elements of hip hop? Anybody? Go ahead. Dancing, dancing right? What they originally called b-boying or b-girling, break dancing, what else? Huh? Graffiti, you got it, you got two. Give me two more, yes. Oh, my favorite, turntables. Turntable, okay. <laughs> right now I'm about to hire you and take you on the road, right? <laughs> right so, so, so DJing. DJ, and what's the last one? And the most popular that people associate with, with hip hop? Um, I'm thinking of like different influences of music that all came to. Not just the different, not just sampling or the different. What's the uh, rap? Yeah. MCing, right? So hip hop, when it initially comes, is kind of right a social movement, a liberative movement. But here's the problem. As with any movement, it's evolved. And some have contended that over the years, rather than being a movement that advocates justice on behalf of the least of these, hip hop has somehow lost its way. Particularly in the 
is one form of hip hop that emerged, gangster rap, became the subject, right, of immense scrutiny. And some of the descriptions and perceptions of that form and then the wider culture of hip hop was that hip hop was just too violent, right? It was inciting and encouraging violence. It was promoting racist thought, right? Homophobic thought. Hip hop was misogynistic. It was brutal, right? Objectifying women in different ways. And anybody who was associated with hip hop as a consumer somehow became perceived in that way. I just want to underscore that that remains a challenge, right, that we're contending with today. That when some persons view, right, for example, a young man who is in a gas station, who is listening to rap music because of the perceptions associated with hip hop and being a consumer of hip hop, somehow, right, there is a notion that that young person is corruptive or pathological and as such, right, some people have used violence as a way, right, of carrying out those perceptions and lives are lost, right? Lives are lost, but the root of it is a kind of flawed perception. I want to say I'm not here to romanticize hip-hop, right? There are certainly challenges and critiques that hip-hop warrants, but I want you to know that there are many faces and sides of hip-hop. Spirituality, religion, faith within the context of hip hop is not new. It's been there from the beginning, right? So here's where we'll end. Who's the artist on the bottom left? Now I know y'all are young, but come on, help me here. Who, who said that? Oh my God, I love you, I love you. She said you. Who's the artist on the right? Tupac. The late Tupac. How many, how many, even though you guys were probably just being born, right, around this time, uh, how many of you engage with Tupac? You appreciate Tupac, okay? Who's the artist top left? Lamar. Okay. You say that like it was a trick question. <laughs> Kendrick. Okay, and who's the artist on the rock? <laughs> Kanye. Kanye's been in the news a lot lately. So what has been significant, what's been significant about hip hop is that it's an art form that emerges from young people, right? And is also engaged by young people. Each of these artists that I've put up has been engaged in, right? Spiritual questing, religious thought, and faith within the context of hip hop. The challenge that some people have is that these four men, and I'm gonna get to the females in a second, don't tightly fit into the boxes of who people perceive to be those that are interested in religion or spirituality. They're primarily viewed, right, as secular artists. One of the things that happens within the context of hip hop is the engagement in what we call God talk, right? So it's simply talk about God. One of the reasons why hip hop is so significant to young people or young adults, and we can have an honest conversation about this because I talk to my own young people and young adults about this. Oftentimes when we talk about God, right? Like when I was in undergrad, we had to take a, a class problem of God, right? Are they still, Lynn, can you do that? No, okay, clearly not. Um, and we had to take, right, I went to a Catholic Jesuit institution's different, right, courses about religion and, and theology, but I struggled. I struggled as I was in those classes because the way in which my professors and others talked about God seemed so divorced, right, and disconnected from my lived experience and my reality that for me, God didn't really have a connection, right, to my world and my life in that particular way. What is significant about God talk in hip hop is that these artists are engaging, right, in reflections around spiritual, religious questions, but they are doing it 
in ways that assume significance, right, and meaning for the lives of young adults, and particularly young adults, that represent certain constituencies. So let's probe a little further. One of the ways that they do that, right, that God Talk shows up within the work of these artists is through its attention to particular themes, right? So everybody tells you that young adulthood, right, is a phase of life where there are no problems in life. That you just have it so easy, right, that life is supposed to be glorious as you're moving into your 20s and post life. But the reality is, for many young adults, right, young adulthood doesn't feel like a bowl of cherries. It doesn't feel carefree, right? And one of the things that these artists draw attention to is that suffering, pain, motifs that are central in so many faith traditions, whether you are talking about it within the context of sacred text, right, or whether you are talking about, about the events that faith traditions celebrate, but oftentimes, right, it's not translated in a particular tongue. Here these artists are inviting God talk, right, around experiences of suffering. Of the four artists that are highlighted on the other page, who's one example of an artist who can cite a work, right, a musical text or piece that's associated with an exploration of suffering that invites conversation about God or invites conversation about religion or spirituality? Anybody? Yes, go ahead. Kanye, Jesus was. Right. Well, Kanye is the most obvious, right? And among the most controversial. <laughs> Jesus walks, right? Where Kanye, who was primarily viewed as a secular artist, invites, right, a reflection on Jesus. This person who is at the center, right, of a particular faith tradition. And then Kanye and Jay had an album, Church in the Wild, right? And we weren't sure kind of where Kanye was. And now Kanye, his most recent album is what? Uh, Jesus is King, right? So he's kind of taking people on this ride. Outside of Kanye, that's pretty obvious. Who else? Yes. Kendrick. Kendrick. And we're going to come back to Kendrick in a second. Give me, give me an example in Kendrick's work of the intersection between spirituality. All right. Okay, you got to give me an example from the text of All Right. Come on, come on, all right, which is one of Kendrick's most popular tracks. If God got us, we gonna be all right. Kendrick is inviting, right, God's assistance. He is offering a lament of sorts, a conversation, but saying to community, we're not just doing this by ourselves, right? God is with us, we are engaging. How many of you know his original, what was his original album? Yes, you're on, you're on. I feel like this is Jeopardy for 500, <laughs> yes. It's like the Mad City on one of his tracks. What is the opening of one of Kendrick's songs? What does he do in one of those tracks? Yes, go ahead. A prayer. Woo! One expression of spirituality are the spiritual practices that we engage, right? Liturgy, scripture, reading sacred text, prayer. Here, you have a supposedly secular artist opening one of his best selling records with a prayer, right? With a prayer. So, hip hop is rife with spirituality. Give me an example out of Pac's work. Anybody, go ahead. Um, track Hail, Mary. Hail Mary. Now, why is that significant? Why is Hail Mary significant? What do we typically associate Hail Mary with? Football. <laughs> <laughs> what do we typically associate? We're talking about spirituality. Hail Mary. Come on. Rosary. Yes, rosary, right? But here, Pac. It has an album title, right? Hail Mary, 
a song, Hail Mary. So the intersection is there. It's not just a lyrical content. If you look at the album covers, right, there are religious symbols. We have many rap artists over the years who've been depicted as the figure of Christ, right, which assumes that God shows up in our bodily forms, right? Yes. All right, so let's kind of move on. We're coming down, almost done. So somebody hit it. Spirituality is not just something, right, that we're engaging, but it also calls us to action and to activism. Where in hip hop do we see the intersection between spirituality and activism, anybody? There was an example that was given earlier. Anybody? <coughs> Come on, you, you, you're on a roll. <coughs> Very strong here. Spirituality and activism. There is an example already cited and given. Go ahead, Nick. Uh, activism to any kind, like in society? Yeah. Oh, like, like Grandmaster Flash and Fury Spots, uh, okay. the message. I, don't, I do not know what to do with Nick. <laughs> Nick is a hip hop is historian right here. So Grandmaster Flash, the, the message is one example, but Kanye, I mean not Kanye, Kendrick, right? All right, it's also an example of the intersection between activism, the call to social acti activism, right? In response, but recognizing that the call to justice is not just our work, it is also God's work. All right, since we've asked some questions, the final piece that I wanted to talk about, and maybe we can ask some questions about it, but I do want to give you some time. This is where my current research is, is landing, and I'll just say one quick thing about it. is gender and spirituality, right? Here's why. For... Um, all of last year, I was conducting focus groups with a group of young women from our seminary and exploring the significance, the intersection between spirituality and gender in their lives. One of the reasons why I'm trying to forefront the faces, right, and voices of women and their engagement with hip hop is because hip hop has, has often been viewed as hyper masculine, right, and a space that objectifies and is misogynistic. And yet, so many women have been architects within hip hop, right? And their work and contributions is often not recognized. When people talk about hip hop and young women, whether it's through the lens of spirituality or otherwise, there's a tendency to position young adult women as victims, right, of hip hop. And a part of what research, ethnographic research and other forms of research is showing is that young women are not as helpless, right, as some people perceive them to be. That hip hop is not just a space in which, right, they're experiencing objectification, but they use hip hop as a way of constructing powerful feminine identities that also engages spirituality. Two of the artists that I have been most concerned with, Lauren Hill, right? And well, uh, an artist that some people are surprised that I'm engaging through that lens is Queen B, Beyonce. All right, I'm gonna stop there and give you a chance for the next few minutes to ask some questions. Before we ask questions. most recently I've been doing a lot of research and writing on, Beyonce has undergone, I was not always a Beyonce fan. Let me, let me, in the spirit of full disclosure, I got on board with Beyonce after Lemonade. I've always thought that she was amazingly talented, right? And I know Beyonce, like the beehive is just crazy. But for me, I came to Beyonce late. I was on a flight uh, back from Europe when something came up 
on my news feed about lemonade. When I, I viewed lemonade, despite jet lag, about three times that night. I was so struck at the intersection, right, of spiritual and religious <coughs> themes as they also engage themes of resistance, right? And, and the thing about lemonade that is also, I think, indicative of the way spirituality and religiosity operates within the context of hip hop is that it's not a monolith, right? Some people, right, I, I, Beyonce has identified herself as being Christian in the past, right? But what she engages is spiritual and religious discourse through the images she uses, right? Through her songs and music in a way that invites multiple spiritualities, right? To, to be highlighted and displayed. One expression of that is Christian spirituality, but other expressions of that are spiritualities that come out of African, right? Sensibilities that are not Christian based. So she's an in, interesting point of intersection for me as a way in which interfaith dialogue, right? Takes place, hip hop, engages multiple expressions of spirituality in the religious, okay? There are Muslims who engage, right, in hip hop culture who produce art that reflects that faith tradition. Jewish persons, right, who are engaging hip hop. Five percenters, right? Israelites who are engaging hip hop. It's not a monolith in that sense. Beyonce is one person for me that highlights spiritual and religious themes. I don't necessarily think that was indicative, right, or pronounced in her earliest work. I use Beyonce particularly as a womanist, spiritual resource, which is a form of spirituality that is shaped and informed by the lives, narratives, and stories of black women. And I think Lemonade is a prime example of that. Okay, anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, go ahead. Um, when you when you brought up the uh, gender and spirituality put in hip hop, um, and you gave us these artists, I, one artist that came to mind was Rhapsody. Mm, and there she, are a number of artists. And she mm. has a song with Kendrick Lamar that's very very uh, reflecting. Mm. It's called, the song called Power. Mm. Um, it's it's like her and Kendrick both mm. exchange verses. It's very. Cool. I love that. I love that. One of the projects that I'm engaged in is how, right, music soundtracks our theology, our faith practices and beliefs, right? So Beyonce's on that, Lauren is all on that, and artists like Rhapsody is on that, but there are a variety of different artists. Thank you for that. You had a question? Well, I was gonna, um, I was gonna, I guess, further talk about, about how like I feel like Beyonce's uh, music is very much like fluid in religion, mm. um, especially like because like in Lemonade, the the poetry in Lemonade was written by a black Muslim woman. Mm. Um, I don't know if you, her name is Lauren Sanchez. Absolutely, yeah. you know I know. So um, and also with with Lauren Hill, um, who is like my favorite artist. Right, right, yes. right, right. Come on, come on, give Lauren Hill respect. Now I think we're gonna get the mind together, but come on. There's um. Also, like, I feel like growing up, like, as a Muslim, like, there was a lot in hip hop for me to. Come on, to, like, a whole lot. Especially with Lauren, yeah, especially with Lauren, like. I, From Hodge like, to hip hop. Right, yeah, like, mm -hmm. it came. So I was born in 98, and. Um, okay, you're Jupiter dating, was, you're like, 98. Was, right, yeah, it was, was, was um, I guess, came out that year, and, yes. like, when I started. 99. 99. Oh, come that on. 99? 99. Okay. And what was so, the name of that album? As I began to listen to it, as right. I got older, like I didn't realize that there were so many like uh, references to Islam. Like I was listening Come to on. it when I was younger, and I like never made the connection. Of right. But it's, yes. Absolutely, Islam, right? Um, Christian references, right? Yeah. And also Rastafarian, yeah. right? Yeah. Ideology, okay. And we know her connection to the Marley clan. Yeah. Okay, so anybody else, anybody else, before you release me, anybody else? <laughs> Seeing, go ahead, go ahead, what was it? Um, this has been fun. Do you think um, in the next five to ten years we'll see more uh, 
like um like what you were all like what you were talking about in general do yeah. you think we'll see more like spirituality within hip-hop um, and like more just like reflection and inviting the like the communication my, my hope um it certainly um would uh promote job security for me. Um, but no, but, but, but let me say that that is um, a part of a question that I am engaging, certainly as a scholar and a researcher. But I'm interested to know in, in what you think. This is my, my final word. Um, it's yours. Hip hop is hugely significant, right? Um, one of the things that I have strived to do both in the academy and um, on the ground in faith communities to bolster the significance of hip hop, right? So I create courses around hip hop. Uh, I invite scholars to talk about the intersection with hip hop and um, spirituality. Uh, but it is not me as a professor serving as the expert. My approach to teaching and learning is that young people and young adults right who are engaging hip-hop are providing the path forward for how we teach how we engage in faith community so i view you all right as the experts in that work and i hope that some of you post saint francis will think about what a career in religious professionalism might look like i certainly never thought in undergrad i was an american government major not even a uh, a minor in theology or religion, but somehow life led me to this path as a minister and as a professor working in faith, in spirituality and religious life. And I want some of you who perhaps have not thought about those vocational trajectories to give more serious consideration to what work you might want to do, right? And you've got a great support team here in missions ministry and interfaith dialogue so thank you for having me thank you